Hello and welcome to California Bountiful. I'm your host, Aubrey Aquino. Most Californian olive oils are so good because they're made using olives grown on our rich California soil. And if you see the California Olive Oil Council seal, that means it was 100% California grown. Well, right now we're in Lodi, California, and we are in the middle of an olive orchard, of a super high density olive orchard, which is kind of a new method of planting. And it's really changing the landscape of how olives are planted and grown in California and around the world. In California, you really get hundreds of varieties of olives. You get eclectic brands, you know, more traditional brands. It's just a really fun place to be for olive oil. California holds among the highest standard in the world for extra virgin olive oil. And if the product meets both chemical and sensory standards to be sold as extra virgin, it gets the California Olive Oil Council seal of approval. The real value of the seal is it ties that bottle to a person. It's not this bottle coming from seven different countries that's a commodity. It's somebody who made that oil and went through the effort to make sure it was high quality and that it met standards and then put the seal on it so that you as a customer know that what it is that you're buying. Extra virgin is the minimum standard. I think what we can do in California that's really gonna change the landscape of olive oil is really focusing on what's amazing about our oils, the flavors and aromas, uh, the soil, the regions, the makers, the growers. I think all of that is really distilled into a bottle. David Garcia Aguirre is a master miller, the oil maker, and is passionate about the future for olives grown in the Golden State. The reality is they grow in a very limited area around the world, and California just happens to be right in the middle of it. So there's really no reason why California shouldn't be doing olive oil, right? What matters most in olive oil is the freshness of the olive oil. It has to be really high quality fruit to make a really high quality oil. And then it's how fresh is that oil when I get it. So we should think about olive oil like we think about lettuce. It's not what's the shelf life, it's how fresh is this. Another fan of the crop is Benina Montez, who diversified her family's farm beyond almonds. We're new to it, so it's been a little bit of a learning curve, but we really love them. They're pretty easy to grow, not a lot of labor. They use less water than our almonds, and they are providing a nutrient-dense, like killer, awesome product. And so we're really into having nutrient density. On our farm, we primarily have Arbequina and Arbasana varieties, and we have it in a blend. Uh, we do also have a border of Koraniki. Primarily in California, that's what's being grown is Arbequina and Arbasana. There are more than 100 varieties of olives that are produced in state for making olive oil, but it's the native elements that really make the difference. It's essentially a fresh pressed juice, so it retains all of those nutrients and antioxidants that are in the fruit. And because of that, it can have a really positive impact on our health. It is liquid gold with polyphenols in it and a bunch of other yummy, healthy components. <laughs> what excites me most is that most people have never had fresh oil before. And the moment you have a fresh oil and it clicks that it's actually juice from a fruit, it's like this wonderful aha moment, like, well, duh, of course that's what it tastes like. Of course that's what it smells like. It smells like natural things, herbs and grasses and fruits. Next, I had to get a taste. All right, David, so now I'm gonna taste some of this California olive oil you've been telling me all about. Yeah, so tasting is a super important part of olive oil. It's one of the few foods that actually has a sensory uh, component in a legal grade definition. So grab this clear one here. Okay. This is a warming mat. We're warming oh, okay. up the oil mm -hmm. so that it releases all of those aromas. So all the right. very first thing we do is we take the lid off and we smell it and we ask ourselves if it smells like fresh natural things, herbs, grasses, uh, fruits, anything like that. Okay. So. Oh, well, there's plenty of aroma coming off that. Yeah, oh right? So there's fresh cut grass, uh, basil, like mm -hmm. those kinds of things. So that is the first telltale sign of a fresh oil. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put some in our mouth and we're gonna swish it around and then we're gonna suck oxygen through in what's called a slurp or a serpaggio. So it looks like this. Perfect. Exactly. And then you swallow it. 
So what we're looking for after we swallow it is a warm, spicy feeling in the back of the throat. Right? I definitely feel the spiciness. Exactly. So that comes from all the natural antioxidants that we capture uh, in the milling process. <laughs> the other thing I want you to notice is now that we've had the oil and it's been a minute, right? Your mouth is super clean, right? It's not greasy, it's not oily, yeah. it's not like you've been chewing on a stick of butter or anything, right? Right. Some oils are more robust, right? They're like the cab and the pinot, some oils will have a lot of spicy, peppery, uh, they'll be very intense. Mm -hmm. Some are more delicate um, and are more like fruity and aromatic. But yeah, I'll just keep coming back to it. At the end of the day, that none of that matters unless the oil's fresh. So for fresh, extra virgin olive oil, find the seal that guarantees it. Now time for a bountiful beverage. Hey everybody, my name is Jason Poole. I'm one of the founders here at Midtown Spirits in Sacramento. We're proud to be one of the only distilleries here in the Sacramento County and only one in the city. Today we're gonna to be making one of my favorite spring drinks called the Giggle Juice. Reason being called Giggle Juice is it's gonna make you smile, it's gonna taste phenomenal, and a little bit of effervescence out of the uh, bubbly rosé or Moscato is gonna get that nose tickling and give you a smile. First up, we're gonna be taking our Midtown Classic 100% Corn Vodka. Two ounce pour of that is gonna be going right into the shaker here. We're gonna be taking two ounces of the cherry lemonade that we've made before. We are going to be taking our ice. Just a light shake just to incorporate those. And this does not need to be double strained because we don't have anything that we're really trying to get out of there. Okay. If you like it a little bit sweeter, a little bit of Sprite. If you like it a little bit less sweet, a little soda water. Either way, you're gonna to be topping it off with a bubbly rosé or Moscato, depending on the type of wine that you prefer. That gives it that nice effervescence up top. All we have to do is add a straw and any other fun garnish you might approve of, and you are sipping the best spring fun cocktail that you could possibly be putting into you. Still ahead, we're on the Central Coast for a peasant's feast. But first, we're gonna add a little heat to the show with a visit to the Boonville Barn Collective. California Bountiful is brought to you by the California Farm Bureau. A portion of the program brought to you by the California Olive Oil Council. Hey, Brad, you know how Nationwide is more than an insurance company? Oh, yeah. They're one of America's largest financial services companies. Could we get that in a song like Business Life Retirement? Or Nationwide's there to protect. Uh, maybe leave the songs to me. But I'm the one with three Grammys. I'm kind of the jingle guy. I'm not sure I agree with that. Well, I'm not sure I like your hat. Well, it would never fit on you. Wow. <laughs> Our childhoods stay with us well beyond our early years. Adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, can increase our risk of serious physical and mental health conditions, along with a lot of other challenges. Amigos y amigas, no matter what we faced early in our lives and along the way, healing is possible. Through our culture and shared narratives, we build hope and create joy together. To learn more or for support, visit numberstory.org. California in Anderson Valley in Mendocino County at Boonville Barn Collective and we are a 10 acre farm that mostly produces specialty chilies but we don't sell anything fresh we harvest everything by hand and dry every single one of those peppers either into a whole dried chili a chili flake or a chili powder so we have the peppers we also grow dry beans some strawberries and olives for olive oil Chrissy Scomegna is the founder and owner at Boonville Barn Collective, where they've been producing distinctive chili powders for more than a decade. This is a really great region for growing chilies because it gets really hot during the day in the summer, usually, and cools down at the night, so the plants get a little bit of a reprieve. 
And while it's not a great place to grow incredibly hot peppers, because they need a lot more days of heat to develop all of their like strong heat flavors and to become fully ripe, we're really growing chilies for their flavor. We're able to start the, the chilies from seed in our greenhouse in February, and then bring all the plants out to the field at the middle of May, get them planted in the ground, and then really wait till every pepper out on the field is fully ripe before we harvest anything. And that generally happens mid-September, most of October, and even early November. So it's a really full year growing season um, compared to trying to get the first fresh chili to market in the middle of July. So the main chili that we grow is the Espelette chili. Um, it's originally from France, the Basque region of France, and it, it's used for piment d'Espelette chili powder. Um, and we started growing this about 12 years ago after we, the restaurant that I was working at used a lot of the French piment d'Espelette in the kitchen, and we wanted to try to grow something ourselves to be able to have our own California-grown Espelette chili. So we got some seeds, started growing it, and 12 years later, we've made a full business out of it. Since these peppers are California grown, they were given a local moniker. We call our chili powder Piment de Ville as being the pepper of Boonville. Um, and Espelette chili powder is a little sweet, a little spicy. Um, and you can think about it really as an all purpose chili that's going to add a lot of good flavor and like bottom notes to the dishes that you're making instead of like a high heat on the top of something. So we use it in place of black pepper. Um, we use it on anything that we're gonna add salt to. You can use it in sweet applications, savory applications. Um, it's a really good all-purpose chili that uh, is getting more popular with home cooks, which we love. And it's also a really popular chili powder for chefs to use across the country. We started with like 15 plants and like at our peak, we've had I think about like 70,000 Espelette chili plants in the ground. Um, which is, it's a lot. It's a lot of peppers to be harvesting. It's a fun thing to grow. It's also hard to grow something that a lot of people don't necessarily know about. Um, folks are used to having like cayenne chili powder and paprika in their spice drawers and might not be so familiar with um, more specialty chilies with different names from different countries. One of the secret ingredients in Boonville's spice success is the farm's foreman. Oh, yeah, it'll be nice to nice to harvest these. So Nacho Flores has worked with us from the start. When we first got the seeds, we asked Nacho, like, hey Nacho, can you, can you grow these peppers for us? And he said, of course, of course I can grow chilies. I grew up growing chilies and corn. This is easy for me. And so he came into the kitchen one day in September with a big bus tub full of fresh peppers and was like, all right, Chrissy, I did my job. Like, what happens next? Um, and so then I got to learn through a lot of trial and error, the best way is to dry peppers, the best way is to grind them. Um, and it's been a learning experience for the 12 years. Also, we're able to grow different chilies that he misses from his home in Mexico, and that's been a really great factor in um, expanding the different chilies that we grow on the farm, um, is trying to figure out, Nacho, like, what are some fun peppers that you miss that you'd want to try to grow here? A fresh farm-to-jar operation that's attracting widespread attention. We start that seed in our greenhouse, bring the plants out here, grow the chilies, and then we harvest everything, bring them back up to their greenhouse that we're able to use throughout the year. Um, and the chilies dry in the greenhouse for a while. We take out all the seeds and stems, put them in our dehydrator, and then we're able to grind all the chilies when they're ready. It's in our hands and our care the whole time, and that's something that we never plan to change. We're also the largest producer of Espelette chili powder outside of France, um, which is pretty fun, even though it's only four acres of peppers. Chefs in over 750 restaurants use our chilies across the country. Whenever people hear that we grow chilies, they're always like, what's the hottest pepper we, you grow? And I'm like, we don't, we don't actually grow hot chilies. Some of them are spicier, um, but chilies really are beautiful for the flavor that they can add to different dishes. Um, and so specifically the Espelette chili, whenever people are like, oh, this isn't very hot. I'm like, no, that, it's not supposed to be hot. Like it's, it's flavorful and you, you can taste the beautiful flavor in it, um, but you're not gonna get a lot of high heat. It's been a learning experience to like, develop the confidence to like work in that industry and really be able to acknowledge that what we're doing is special, the skills that I have to add to this business are really special, and that it's an opportunity to be a woman farming in California, and it's, it's a great place to do it. Coming up, we scrub out the story behind loofahs. And next, we head into the kitchen for a tasty dish with a deep sea twist. You're watching California Bountiful. Sometimes we lose, sometimes we win Sometimes we try to fit it all in Sometimes we don't know what's in store Sometimes we find what we're looking for Sometimes we're rolling easy and free Sometimes one and one make 
63 so much to love along this ride that's why nationwide is on your side the california farm bureau has protected the diverse agricultural interests in the Golden State for over a century. As part of the California Farm Bureau, you'll add your voice to the combined strength of over 34,000 farmers, ranchers, and families through our state. That means more connections, more influence, and more opportunity to fight for the issues that impact your life. With your support behind us, California Farm Bureau's robust government affairs, federal policy, and farm pact and legal teams work tirelessly to advocate at all levels of government, protecting and promoting our shared way of life. Together, California Farm Bureau and our members are standing up for farmers, ranchers, and families throughout the Golden State every day, working to cultivate a bountiful future for all Californians. Hey everybody, at this Solvang restaurant, the menus honor every part of the plants and animals which are served on their tables. And the plates, well, they're designed to specifically highlight the local agriculture. We're going behind the scenes to experience Peasant's Feast. Peasant's Feast is all about comfort food and eating what you love with the people you love. So at lunch we do very much like classic Americana and then at dinner it's much more seasonally driven by what we have at the farmer's market. We're lucky enough here in Solvang that we actually have a market just two blocks down the road. Uh, so I get to go to the market every week on Wednesday and just start building the menu around what we see at the market. Everything we have from the wine to all the different food products are as local as we can possibly get and as fresh as possible. Hi, I'm Brendan Collins. I'm the chef at Peasant's Feast Restaurant in Solvang, and I'm gonna be making sea urchin carbonara today. We're gonna start with a little bit of bacon fat. We make our own bacon here in-house, and in the process, render out quite a bit of fat, and we get to use that for some really beautiful flavor in this dish. Add some of that bacon, went ahead and diced it up. Nice and small, and we're gonna get that crispy. We're gonna go ahead and add a little bit of fish stock. And some butter. And add our noodles. So the fish stock we make from the bones left over from the fish that Stephanie brings us for the week. Uh, so in this case, it's halibut. Whatever fish we're running on the menu, that's what fish we use to make the stock for the base of the carbonara. Some lemon zest. And we're gonna add a little bit of creme fraiche. Both those things give the dish a little bit of lift to keep it from being too rich. Add a nice big pinch of chives. And then a little bit of salt. You wanna be pretty light with the salt because you can always add more after. And the various different ingredients that go into it also have a decent amount of salt in them already. Give it a little twirl and move to the plate. And then we're gonna finish it with a little more chives. Some Parmesan right over the top. And you can Bury it in Parmesan. You can be that guy at the restaurant that doesn't know when to say when, when uh, they're grating Parmesan over his salad or pasta. And then our fresh uni. And then just a little bit of fleur de sel right over the top of the uni to really make that flavor pop. And here's our sea urchin carbonara. Hi, I'm Leslie Dabney and I'm the Vineyard Mom and I have some great tips I'd like to share with you today for wine pairings that can go with any meal. Today I have five different dishes, four proteins and one veggie. Let's get started. 
first, I have a delicious steak. And with that, I'm gonna pair a Cabernet Sauvignon or even a Merlot. These full-bodied red wines with their tannins really help to balance that fattiness and the beefiness of the steak. Next, I have a delicious veggie dish. And I like a Chardonnay with my vegetables. This creamy and velvety texture and flavor really pairs great with any veggie. Next, I have chicken. And I know what you're thinking, white wine, but not necessarily. I'm pairing a rosé with this. Chicken always takes on the flavor of whatever you're cooking it with. So if you wanna have a little spice or a little bit of heat, this fruit forward flavor of a rosé lets that dish still shine. Next, I have a pork dish. And with that, I'm gonna pair a Pinot Noir. Yes, this is a red wine, but it's a lighter wine with less tannins, and that allows that delicate flavor of the pork to really be enhanced. And lastly, I have fish. And with fish, I love to have a Sauvignon Blanc. It's a lighter white wine with very soft, beautiful fruit flavor. That allows the seafood and the fish to really be highlighted. If you want some more food and wine pairings, just go to at the Vineyard Mom on Instagram. Cheers. Straight ahead, we clean up the show and squeeze out all the good stuff in Lufa Gardens. Hey Brad, you know how Nationwide is more than an insurance company? Oh yeah, they're one of America's largest financial services companies. Could we get that in a song like Business Life Retirement? Or Nationwide's there to protect. Eh, maybe leave the songs to me. But I'm the one with three Grammys. I'm kind of the jingle guy. I'm not sure I agree with that. Well, I'm not sure I like your hat. Well, it would never fit on you. Wow. <laughs> Are you looking to uncover more of the bounty of California's rich, diverse, and delicious food and wine scene? Then it's time to get social with us. Find even more great content from Farm to Fork and everything in between, like recipes behind the scenes on food and wine tours, plus useful info on what's good for you and so much more. Join an engaging community of like-minded foodies and tell us what great story ideas you have for us too. So what are you waiting for? Get in on the conversation now. Find, follow, and talk to us on social at CA Bountiful. When you hear the word loofah, you might think of this, a product you'd use in the bath or the shower. But did you realize that this loofah started like this? It grows on a vine and in a farm. We're in Reedley, California. We're east of Reedley on Highway 180 before you go up, go up to the mountains. And this is our loofah farm. As far as plants go, we probably have about a thousand to fifteen hundred plants growing and each plant produces up to about 20 lufa per year. They are subtropical and so if, if it didn't freeze here we wouldn't have to replant every year. We'd plant maybe every five or six years which would really be great but we have what we have and we're grateful for what actually grows here. Not a typical garden vegetable. Lufa Gardens is cultivating these uber unique gourds that produce lufa. There's evidence of it that they've been around for 10,000 years. The Egyptians grew it. I mean, the, the botanical name is Lufa aegyptiaca, is what we grow. And that's actually a variety that was developed in ancient Egypt. They're on a vine like a cucumber. They take about half as much water as a cucumber plant, which is really really great. I was really surprised about it because it takes a lot of moisture to, to fill these things. In springtime, this is a massive wall of, of yellow flowers with, and it's, it's just buzzing and humming with, with honeybees and big black bumblebees. They are edible. We have fried them up. They're pretty good. They're like squash. As long as they're about this size, you could probably cut them and fry them up and eat them. But after that, they develop the skeleton inside and it becomes very fibrous and my cows won't even eat them. They'll chew them a little bit and spit them out. And on this farm, 
it's what's on the inside that counts. When they're yellowish, they've, you, you can tell because they've lost all the weight. When they're green, they're very heavy. This one's probably five pounds. This one's probably three ounces. So it, the plant, all the moisture goes back into the plant quite rapidly. This one here, see how, how much moisture there's in here. And that, once, it, once you take it off the plant, it rots really quickly. A small family operation, it's all hands on deck to get them ready for market. Once they're dry, like this, or they're a little bit yellow, we can pick them. We'll uh, cut the ends off. We'll throw them in a bucket of, well, into a, some bins of water, just straight water, and soak them for a day. What that does, it, it loosens the skin. You know, I've seen videos of people trying to pick it off with their fingernail. You know, the process is just really time consuming. We put it in water, let it soak for a day, and it peel, generally it peels very easy. And then we take a, a pressure hose and hose, it, hose all of the uh, pulp and the seeds out and we have racks and we just put them in the sun for a couple days and they're ready to cut to size. It's their fibrous interior that makes for a good scrubbing sponge and can provide consumers with an aha moment. They normally think it's like corn or bread and then they get to it and they're like, what is this? And then we explain that, what a loofah is and then they are always like, is it a sea sponge? I'm like, no, 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 we don't grow them. Like we grow them on a vine, but we're not like farming animals. So we cut them down per size for body sponges or we make our own loofah soap. There's some that are softer for face and there's some that are a little bit more abrasive that we use for dishes. I'm gonna have to try this on my dishes because I hate that sponge smell. And yeah, then oh. it, and then it gets on your hands. Yeah. Um, yeah that's pretty soft. We have our try me cans. You could try the loofahs so you can see how soft they are. Um, a lot of loofahs that you get, they're imported and they're fumigated very, very hard, but our loofahs soften up and that's kind of our whole niche. The loofahs are still pretty soft on their own just because the variety that we grow is soft. However, once they get wet, it's like butter. So we have to have the try me cans so people can feel it. And then people are shocked sometimes because they don't realize that it's wet or they think it's alive because again, they think it's like the sea sponge. I'm like, no, no, no. It's just the product wet. The curiosity has peaked and we get to tell them all about loofahs and 95% of people don't know about earth-grown loofahs. They all think it's a sea sponge. Our loofahs are, they become very soft, but they're extremely durable. And it surprises me every time too. On the next California Bountiful, we check out sun-fed cattle and learn about a chocolate superfood that starts with a wine vine. You don't want to miss it. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.